Hi there, I trust that you're all doing well. I've been really excited about this particular series on the praying church and I trust that it's helping you to equip you to go to your next level of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you, God, that it's in your interest to help us to improve in our prayer lives. God, we ask that you come by your spirit today and ignite and activate us to a new dimension of prayer. In Jesus' name. Towards the end of my sermon last week, I mentioned the importance of praying with all kinds of prayer. I don't know if you remember that. I spoke about the importance of asking yourself whether it is time for thanksgiving or is it the time for the prayer of agreement or the prayer of faith. It's so important to ask these questions. Is it time to petition or is it the time for the prayer of binding and loosing? That's warfare prayer. It's crucial that we ask these questions. You see, when you do this, it allows you to shift gears in your prayer. When you don't do so, it can be like driving a vehicle that has got five gears and on top of that, it's got four by four uh, facilities, but you just stay in that gear one, that first gear. Right. So we've been taught about many types of prayer, but over the next couple of weeks, I want to focus on what I call uncommon prayers that need to be prayed by believers. And a lot of what I'm calling uncommon prayers, they're actually very common in scripture. But unfortunately, in the modern day world, they're not that common. And that's what we want to really look at. So in this sermon, I will start with the first three, and then next week I'll continue with the others. The first one I want to focus on today is the prayer of consecration. The prayer of consecration. To consecrate is to formally dedicate. That's what consecration is. It's a fancy word for dedication or to devote yourself to someone or something. Okay, But it's, it's almost like a formal kind of process. And the prayer of consecration can be made for your life in general or for commitment to a specific assignment. So you'll find in some traditional churches, they'll talk about the consecration service for a bishop, when someone is becoming a bishop, for example. Let's have a look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 24 through to 28. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, talking about Hannah and Samuel, right? Young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, Eli the priest. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. Okay? For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. So remember, Hannah had been praying for a son, right? And Eli saw that she was praying. And she ended up making a vow to the Lord that if you give me this son, he will serve you all the days of his life. And now she was presenting her son to the Lord, as it were. So Hannah was consecrating someone who was under her stewardship. And that's also the prayer of consecration. There are a lot of things that are under our stewardship that we ought to actually pray the prayer of consecration concerning. See, the basis of the consecration of Samuel was a vow that she had made. And we'll discuss this further as this is actually another type of prayer, the prayer of vows. But we'll talk about it on another occasion. You know, I'm the second born out of four boys and my mom was really hoping to have a girl, right? She had no girls. Uh, But I'm the second born out of these four boys and I was born on a Sunday morning. And when I was presented to her, this was before the days of scans and things like that. When I was presented to her, um, she saw that I was a boy, okay? For, For obvious reasons, she noticed that I was the boy. And it was, it was actually on a Sunday morning when I was born. It was in my grandmother's clinic. My grandmother was a nurse. And she actually ended up accepting that. And she said to the Lord, may he be used in your service, Lord. Okay, S- since it was a Sunday morning. And she just felt like, well, Lord, you've given me this boy. It's another boy I've got now. It's a Sunday morning. May he be used in your service. 
And so I'm not surprised that from the age of 12, I was already preaching. At 14, I was writing Bible studies that grown-ups would actually read and use. Okay, so there's power in dedicating something or someone. There's power in consecration. Very crucial. The prayer of consecration can actually be applied to churches where you consecrate a church. Sometimes maybe based on a vow that you've made that this church will be a church of prayer. And Lord, we commit to pray on a daily basis. Right. You can consecrate businesses. You can consecrate seasons. Lord, this season we are consecrating it to you. You can consecrate a prayer meeting and a conference. You can consecrate days to the Lord. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, it says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The things you can bless and make holy. To make holy is to set apart something for holy use, for God, right? Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So the Sabbath is a type of consecration, right? Uh, You're actually making a declaration that this day I'm making it holy, okay? Baby dedication is often a prayer of consecration for the child and also for the parents. The parents are consecrating themselves to basically say, we're committing ourselves to actually be used by God to raise up this child in a godly way. And we're committing this child to the Lord. And a lot of people don't fully understand that. It's a consecration for, of the child, but also of the parents. You know, when people call me as a pastor to pray for their house or their new car, uh, place they're moving into, um, it's actually a prayer of consecration. And the question is, do they understand what consecration actually looks like? Are they just praying for protection of their new vehicle, right? but they don't give over the property for use for the Lord. You know, the fact of the matter is when you consecrate your home, that new home, you're basically saying, Lord, this is your place and I'm just a steward. May it be used to your, for your honor and for your glory. Can you see the power of consecration? And there's a prayer you pray when you do that. And that's the prayer of consecration. And there's a blessing around that. And I'll talk about that in a while. You know, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, Uh, If you look at his reflections on consecration, they're very powerful. He says this, you know, as he was acquiring certain books, which he would read and so on. He said, Mr. Law's Christian Perfection and Serious Call, that's the name of the material he was reading, were put into my hands. These convinced me more than ever of the absolute impossibility of being half a Christian. And I determined through his grace the absolute necessity of which I was deeply sensible of, to be all devoted to God, to give him all my soul, my body, and my substance. He goes on to talk about how in the year 1729, at the age of 27, I began not only to read, but to study the Bible. It's one thing to read the Bible, it's another thing to study the Bible. As the one, the only standard of truth, and the only model of pure religion. Hence, I saw in a clearer and clearer light the indispensable necessity of having the mind which was in Christ and of walking as Christ also walked in all things. Nor was I afraid of anything more than of bending this rule to the experience of myself or of other people, of allowing myself in any the least disconformity to our grand exemplar. Isn't that powerful? And uh, one of his prayers of consecration, he said, O oh Lord, may nothing dwell in my soul but your pure love alone, till my every thought, word, and act be love. Yes, Lord, may your love possess me whole. You are my joy, my treasure, my crown. So powerful. And I believe that sometimes when we look at this type of material, it inspires us to also craft our own prayers of consecration. And remember, you can pray the prayer of consecration as a general consecration as a believer, but you also pray that prayer as a commitment, dedication, devotion to a particular assignment that the Lord has given you. I want to share with you a few things about consecration. Um, The essence of it is that consecration is complete voluntary surrender of all of one's life 
to the Lord. Complete voluntary surrender of all of one's life to the Lord. And it's such a liberating place to be when you come to that place. You know, often people don't pray the prayer of consecration because they're just thinking to themselves, hey, am I sure about this? Hey, you never know what might happen, right? Um, and I want to share with you 12 things that I've learned about the prayer of consecration. The first thing is that in the prayer of consecration, you're affirming how you belong to God. You're actually affirming how you belong to God. You're basically saying, I am no longer my, my, I no longer belong to myself. I'm not my own. In Exodus 13, verse 2 and verse 12, it says, yeah, consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelite belongs to me, whether human or animal. Verse 12, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. And so it's so interesting how this whole concept of belonging to the Lord and consecration are used interchangeably. If you look at this narrative, it says, consecrate to me every firstborn male. Then it goes on to say, they all belong to me. So consecration is about giving yourself over, right? So that you fully belong for his use. You fully belong to him. The second thing about the prayer of consecration is this. The sincere prayer of consecration gives you access to new dimensions in God. This is so important. It's a wonderful benefit of the prayer of consecration. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 31, then Hezekiah said, you have now dedicated yourselves to the Lord. Come and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings and all those whose hearts were willing brought burnt offerings. I find it so interesting that they couldn't just go and do that. They had to first dedicate themselves to the Lord. Okay. Some translations might say you have now consecrated yourself to the Lord. Then he says you can now draw near. Right. And the word worship literally means to draw near to draw near to God. So you get access to new dimensions of God to the degree to which you're willing to consecrate yourself to him, right? It involves the prayer of consecration. The third thing I've learned about consecration is that the prayer of consecration is actually an act of the will. You can't have it forced upon you. In 1 Chronicles 29, verses 4 to 5, it says, 3,000 talents of gold, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? You see, so it's one thing to just go and, re and, and build a temple. It's another thing to first consecrate yourself, right? An act of the will and then build and so we see that the prayer of consecration is an act of the will. Who is willing? It wasn't forced. Who is willing? The fourth thing I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it can actually involve setting physical things apart for God's glory. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10 through to 11, it says, He sent his son, Joram, to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadadezer who had been at war with To, To Joram. Uh, Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued. You know, very often we acquire things, but it's important for us to pray over those things, isn't it? Not in a stup superstitious way, but to basically say these will be used for God's glory. We acquire things from different places, etc. But it's important for us to be able to say we're dedicating this to the Lord. It's very important. And we see how King David did that. He didn't just take things from other nations and then start using them. But it says that he dedicated these articles to the Lord. 
you know. Uh, demonic spirits are attracted to things. And sometimes you don't know where you got certain things from. And sometimes it's important to basically say, may all these things be cleansed. May all these things be used, Lord, for your honor and for your glory. Not that we're superstitious, not that we're looking for demons on doorknobs and so on. But we come into a place of saying everything in this house is dedicated to the Lord and for his use. The fifth thing I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it results in you being given honor by God to do certain things. You see, when you're not consecrated, you might not be able to do certain things. God might not choose you to do certain things. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 18, they confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn in incense to the Lord. Okay, so he was trespassing in the spirit. He was doing something that only the priests were supposed to do. It says, that, that is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by the Lord God. It's so important to know what our assignment is. Sometimes we can trespass in the spirit. You see, maybe he thought because he's a king, hey, he can just cross over and do certain things. There's certain things people have been consecrated to do, right? There's a certain lifestyle they have to live in order to do those particular things. But here the king thought, hey, let me just do it. He crossed the line. He crossed the line. Okay. Uh, very important. And we see the same thing happening with Saul, where he also started to try and burn sacrifices and so on. And he was rebuked, wasn't he, uh, by Samuel. He crossed the line. The sixth thing I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that there are actually consequences. There are actually consequences to not praying the prayer of consecration. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 22, it says, even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves. Why? Or the Lord will break out against them. Again, you can see that there are consequences to not consecrating yourself to the Lord. And here it's talking about the priests. And so many people, they try to be intercessors, standing in the gap, praying strong warfare prayers. But if you ask them, have you consecrated yourself to the Lord? Have you completely given yourself completely to the Lord? They'll say to you, no. I've got half my foot in the world, half my foot in prayer. That becomes a dangerous thing for you, okay? The seventh thing I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that there are levels of ministry that require greater levels of consecration. And I think you can see it in the scriptures that I'm sharing with you. There's something a king does, and it's important that kings consecrate themselves for that particular task, but doesn't mean they can cross over and start doing what the priests are supposed to do. Now, we see that in the Old Testament, but basically what we're learning is that stay in your lane, right? Um, because there are other people who are doing things that you might be envying or things that you might have idolized, but they've been consecrated for that particular purpose, okay? The eighth thing I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it's actually not limited to pastors and those on so-called ministerial duty, okay? It's a basic requirement for those leading even in government or even in the marketplace, okay? There's a consecration for that. In 2 Kings chapter 23, I'm going to read verse 3, and then I'm going to read verse 24 to 25. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. You see the power of kings. As they consecrate themselves, you see a nation following suit. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and the spiritists, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. This he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book that um, Hilkiah, the priest, had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. 
There are many of us who are in leadership positions in the corporate world, in academic institutions, and God is calling us to pray the prayer of consecration. And as we do so, to lead others in consecration, where they're inspired by us um, getting rid of detestable things, cleansing some of the environments that we work in, saying enough is enough. I'm not, under my watch, this is not going to happen. We know that there were different sorts of kings after him and before him, but he made that decision that under my watch, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that's so powerful for those of us who are leading in different power centers in society. The ninth thing that I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it's actually a requirement for specific assignments. If you look at Exodus chapter 28, verse 3, and then verse 41, it says, Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron, for his consecration, so he may serve me as a priest. Okay? Consecration, so he may serve consecration so he may serve verse 41 after you put these clothes on your brother Aaron and his sons anoint and ordain them consecrate them so they may serve me as priests so there's a consecration that was there for the priests of that time but there's also consecration for different assignments that God calls us to there were those who were consecrated who had practical skills to build the temple they were consecrated for that purpose the 10th thing that I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it results in a blessing. It results in a blessing. In Exodus 32, 29, it says, Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. I like it in the New King James Version. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Why? that he may bestow on you a blessing this day, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. There's a blessing as a result of consecration. The 11th thing that I've learned about the prayer of consecration is that it involves surrendering your body to the Lord. You see, I'm not just consecrating my mind, I'm not just consecrating my spirit, but my body is involved too. And we see this in the New Testament in Romans 12, Verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And here's a powerful prayer of consecration as you consecrate your body to the Lord. I present my body to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice. My body has been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and it belongs to him. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I renounce every way I've misused and abused my body. I bring all those acts under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. I rededicate my body and all its parts to the loving rule of Jesus Christ. I dedicate and consecrate my body to him in every way. I ask for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse my body and make it holy once more. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple now. Restore my body under the complete dominion of Jesus Christ. That's an example of praying the prayer of consecration over your body. It's so, so important. So important. The twelfth thing that I've learned about the prayer of consecration is this. The sincere prayer of consecration will result in effective preparation for fruitful ministry. As you prepare for fruitful ministry, it's so important to pray the prayer of consecration. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. I don't know about you, but I want to be prepared to do any good work. And you know why? One of the reasons why... I want to do that is because not everyone around me who might be naturally talented at doing that particular thing will be available. I want to position myself so that God can use me whenever he needs to. But guess what? I have to have prayed the prayer of consecration so that I'm useful for any good work. Sometimes the reason why we're not useful for any good work is because of lack of consecration. We haven't been cleansed in certain areas. So what does it mean when it says 
cleansing yourself from the latter? We see the answer in verse 20. Verse 20, it says, In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. I don't know about you, but I want to be a vessel of honor that can be used by God. Are you willing to cleanse yourself in order to be a vessel of honor? That's an important question that comes from this passage. Are there some good works that you're not prepared for due to lack of consecration? Just think about that. Powerful when we contemplate on these things. So that's the prayer of consecration. The second type of prayer I want to share with you today is the prayer of confession. The prayer of confession. You know, uh, to confess actually comes from the root word homologos. Okay. And it literally means of one mind, being of one mind. It literally means to agree with someone or something or to say the same as. So when the Holy Spirit convicts you, do you agree? Do you agree? Because that's confession, right? Do you say the same as him or do you say the devil's condemnation? Then that's not true confession. You are now just feeling guilty based on the devil's condemnation, you see. So there are two major types of confession. There's confession of sin and then there's confession of your faith, confession of identity and covenant. So there's confession of sin on the one hand, then there's confession of faith, identity, and covenant, right? Confession is verbalized. It needs to be verbalized. It needs to be vocalized. It's not something that you just do in your mind. And often it actually comes through as a declaration. Very often when we're making declarations in a church setting, in a prayer meeting, those are actually confessions. It's the confession of our faith. It's a confession of our identity in Christ. So the, on the one hand, we've got every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord, right? That's confessing, agreeing, acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. Some translations even say praising him because praise is a form of confession, isn't it? You are good. You are kind. I'm agreeing, right, with regards to who God is. And then on the other hand, we've got confession of our sin, acknowledgement of our sin, and these are very powerful prayers to pray. So, for example, an example of uh, a positive type of confession is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, where uh, Paul says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when? When you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay? Um, so that's a positive type of confession. Right. Uh, another example of that is Romans 14, verse 11. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. Some translations say every tongue will confess God, will praise God. OK, so, so I want to ask you a question. What things do you struggle to verbalize? What things do you struggle to confess? Good things and bad things. You now you have some people saying, oh, that sounds arrogant if I say that. Okay? So they struggle to confess good things about their identity in Christ. right? And they don't verbalize it. Oh, what will people think? Others struggle. Maybe they're struggling with shame. They're in denial to actually verbalize that this is how I've sinned. This is how I've wronged my brother. This is how I've wronged God. People often confess behavior, but they don't confess the mindset behind it when it comes to confession of sin. And it's so important. You see, you might have been impatient with someone. Don't just say, oh Lord, forgive me for my impatience. Okay, maybe the impatience was rooted in self-righteousness. So it's important to confess the self-righteousness. And that's why if you look at some of the old prayer books, very powerful, where they'll talk about how we have sinned against you, Lord, in thought, in word, and in deed. Very often we focus just on the deed, don't we? Oh, forgive me for those deeds. But what about the thought behind the deed? You know, if someone fornicates, oh Lord, forgive me for fornicating. I confess that I fornicated. It was way more than that. Sometimes the confession actually involves, Lord, I was in rebellion. My heart was rebellious. Lord, um, I confess 
my lack of self-control. I confess the way in which I was pridefully independent and didn't listen to the warnings of my brothers and sisters as they warned me about this. I confess concerning the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh that led up to this. I confess that I ignored your voice, your, your still small voice that warned me about this. I confess, God, that I did not take things seriously when I was taught these principles um, uh, years ago. Can you see the power of that? And that's where the cleansing comes. Often when people skim over these things, you find that they focus just on behavioral adjustment, but don't go to the core and don't experience cleansing from a guilty conscience in that particular area. Confession is key to healing. That's one of the things that I've learned about confession. It's key to healing. In James chapter 5, Verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, we love quoting that scripture, don't we? Right? That, hey, you know what? The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. But we must look at the context. Therefore confess your sins to each other. Confession can be made to someone, not just God. Okay? So there's confession as a prayer to God something that you're saying to God, but there's also confection as, as an act, as something you verbalize to someone else. I've also learned that confession is a key with regards to purification and cleansing. If you look at 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and then purify us from all unrighteousness. But it says, if we confess our sins. I've also learned that confession, this prayer of confession is the key to prosperity and it's actually a condition for mercy. In Proverbs 28 verse 13, it says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. This is so important. Don't conceal your sin. Confess it. Confess it. I've also learned that confession must actually be verbalized and vocalized. In Romans 10, verse 9 to 10, it says, If you declare with your mouth, some translations will say, if you, com if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So confession happens with your mouth. For it is with your heart that you believe and you're justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's so important to profess our faith, to declare our faith verbally. And that's why very often the prayer of confession manifests as declarative prayer. Another thing I've learned about confession is that it can be done on behalf of a group of people. It's important to understand this. And we see Daniel as being a good example of this. In Daniel chapter 9, 5 to 6, just look how specific he was as he was praying. He says, we have sinned and done wrong. This is the prayer of confession. We have sinned and done wrong. Was it him or was it on behalf of the Israelites? He was, also, he was talking about his people. He was talking about his people. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings our princes, and our ancestors. So in other words, he was confessing the sin, not just of people who are currently alive, but what had happened in history. Sadly, today you have a lot of people who will say, oh, well, that happened. Yeah, my grandfather did that, but it wasn't me. I didn't do it. Okay. When you're an intercessor, very often you pray prayers of identificational repentance. And from what I've learned about Daniel, he was one of the few people in the Bible, one of the few people where there's nothing mentioned negative about him in terms of sin. We know obviously he, he, he sinned because all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we're not told that he did this bad thing, he did this wrong thing and so on. Yet here he is confessing on behalf of his people, right? It says, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our ancestors and to all the people of the land. Daniel was so specific about what they had done wrong. He goes on to unpack the nature of the sin. For example, we've turned away from the words of the prophets, right? And we've rebelled. He even goes into the sins from past generations. 
That's the power of the prayer of confession. Look at these confessions from the old prayer, prayer books. I think they're so powerful. Okay, this is a particular one from the 7th century. Okay, 7th century. O oh, blessed spirit of truth, you search the heart and test the innermost thoughts. Help me remember my sins and let me see them in your light. Strengthen me also with courage to confess them truly, hiding nothing, excusing nothing, keeping back nothing in my heart. In your mercy, pardon and absolve and thus heal me, that I may arise and sin no more. Through the merits and for the sake of Jesus Christ, my Lord and only Savior. Very powerful. Very powerful. That's from the Mozarabic um, sacramentary in the 7th century. Isn't that amazing? Then there's an interesting general confession. Some of you from traditional churches uh, Anglican Orthodox, you might be familiar with this one. I remember these prayers that we used to pray growing up. And I'm not saying we must just read it and, and say it, you know, like rote learning. No, but there's a way you can personalize it and unpack it for yourself. Okay, so this was typically in, uh, said, um, you know, with the whole congregation, said by the whole congregation after the minister, everyone, you know, kneeling. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders, Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. You know, and a lot of charismaniacs, we tend to react, you know, when old English is used, etc. But I love going back to some of these things because of the depth and the truths that are there. And you can actually make them your own uh, prayer, prayer of confession. <clears throat> it can be so, so powerful in your times of prayer. The third type of prayer I'm going to look at today is the prayer of relinquishment. This is such a powerful prayer. The prayer of relinquishment. What is the meaning of relinquish? Relinquish is basically to voluntarily cease to keep something or claim something. It literally means to give up. And here's some syn synonyms uh, for relinquish. It's to give up. It's to part with. It's to give away, to hand over, to turn over, to lay down, to let go of to resign, to abdicate, to yield, to cede, to surrender, to sign away, to leave, to resign from, to stand down from, to bow out of, to walk out of, to retire from, to depart from. So that's, I'm just I'm using a bit of a word picture there to give you a sense of what to relinquish is. Okay, sometimes it's a word that's actually used when it talks about physically letting go of something. Like when there's a monkey that has stolen your banana or something and you want it to let go. Okay, if a monkey steals your banana, you probably don't want it to let go. You like just chase it away. But it's let go. Stop holding those things. Stop holding on to my things. And we see a powerful example of the prayer of relinquishment with Mary. In Luke chapter 1 verses 34 to 38. Mary had just been approached by the angel and the angel had spoken to her. Gabriel speaks to her and basically announces what's going to happen. She says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. So she hears this word. And she probably still doesn't fully understand how this is going to happen. 
But guess what ha- What she says? It was one of the most powerful prayers of relinquishment. And if she hadn't said this, I don't know what would have happened. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And I believe that many of us are in a season where God is leading us to pray the prayer of relinquishment. It's not necessarily a type of prayer that's prayed over and over again many different times on many different days and so on. No, it's not like we're always praying the prayer of relinquishment. But here we see that she didn't fully understand what was going on, but she submitted. She says, I am the Lord's servant. And some translations read, be it unto me according to thy word. Be it unto me according to thy to thy word. So powerful. And Mary's statement, I believe that is, is, is actually one of the most powerful prayers of relinquishment. Think of the impact it had on human history. Ruth Haley Barton, a teacher of the word, she notes this. She expressed a profound readiness to set aside her own personal concerns in order to participate in the will of God as it unfolded in human history. Are you willing to set aside your own personal concerns in order to participate in the will of God as it unfolds before you in human history? And I want to highlight this. Relinquishment is not fatalism. You know, some people are just like, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. God will just do whatever he wants to do. No, it's not living a life of fatalism. A powerful example of relinquishment is Christ. In Gethsemane. Remember his prayers. I want to take you through this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. Now watch this. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Now I want to just press pause there. When you're a human being, you've got a will. That's just one of the things that makes us human beings. We've got a will. God has given you a will. He doesn't want to squash your will. He doesn't want to override your will. He wants to bring you to a place where you align your will with his will. And the fact that the son of God here was basically stating what his will is, what his desire is, but yielding it to the father's will. That's the prayer of relinquishment. It's not to say I'm a doormat. It's not to say I've got no desires. Lord, this is what I desire. But Lord, you know all things. And I am submitted to you. You come and have your way beyond my desire. Right? So he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Could it be that Jesus was even talking about himself in that situation? My spirit is willing to do what the Father wants, to do what I think he wants, but sure, my flesh is weak. So Father, my Father, I want your way in my life. That's the prayer of relinquishment. I'm relinquishing my will and I'm aligning it with Father God's will. Verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Can you see the process that Jesus actually went through? Which shows me that the prayer of relinquishment often doesn't take place as soon as you start praying. Often it's a process to get there. Often we are praying for a particular thing that we desire But by the end of that time of prayer or that process in God, we find ourselves relinquishing. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away 
unless I drink it. May your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. What is Jesus saying? Can you see there was the struggle? Can you see there was the struggle? But at a certain point when he had relinquished, then there was the action. Come. Hey, if you're going to betray me, do it now. The time has come. And that's the result of the prayer of relinquishment. It kicks you into action in a particular direction, doesn't it? Okay. You end up aligned with the will of God. Richard J. Foster, he wrote something so powerful. He's the guy who wrote the celebration of discipline. And one of the things um, he wrote in some of his writings, he says, struggle, you see, is an essential feature of the prayer of relinquishment. Jesus struggled in the garden so much so that his sweat became like great drops of blood. All of the luminaries in scripture struggled as well. Abraham, as he relinquished his son Isaac. Moses, as he relinquished his understanding of how the deliverer of Israel should function. David, as he relinquished the son given to him by Bathsheba. Mary, as she relinquished control over her future. What's God calling you to relinquish right now? What's he calling you to relinquish? Catherine Marshall writes, uh, and she, she wrote very powerfully, if you get a chance to read some of her books, she says this, this is the prayer of relinquishment. I got my first glimpse of it in 1943. I'd been ill for six months with a widespread lung infection and a bevy of specialists seemed unable to help. Persistent prayer, using all the faith I could muster, had resulted in nothing. One afternoon, a pamphlet was put in my hands. It was the story of a missionary who had been, in, been invalid for eight years. Constantly, she had prayed that God would make her well so that she might do his work. Finally, worn out with futile petition, she prayed, All right, I give up. If you want me to be an invalid, that's your business. I want you even more than I want health. You decide. Within two weeks, the woman was out of bed completely well. This made no sense to me, yet I could not forget the story. On the morning of September the 14th, how can I ever forget that date? I came to the same point of abject acceptance. I'm tired of asking was the burden of my prayer. I'm beaten, finished. God, you decide what you want for me. Tears flowed. I felt no faith as I understood faith, expected nothing. And the result? It was as if I had touched a button that opened windows in heaven. As if some dynamo of heavenly power began flowing, flowing. Within a few hours, I had experienced the presence of the living Christ in a way that wiped away all doubt and revolutionized my life. From that moment, my recovery began. Through this incident, God was trying to teach me something important about prayer. Gradually, I saw that a demanding spirit with self-will as its rudder blocks prayer. I understood that the reason for this is that God absolutely refuses to violate our free will. Unless self-will is voluntarily given up, even God cannot move to answer prayer. Isn't that powerful? And in examining Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Catherine Marshall goes on to say, there's a crucial difference here between acceptance and resignation. There's no resignation in the prayer of relinquishment. Resignation says, this is my situation and I resign myself and settle down to it. Re resignation actually lies down in the dust of a godless universe and steals itself for the worst. Acceptance says, true, this is my situation at the moment. I'll look unblinkingly at the reality of it, but I'll also open up my hands to accept willingly whatever a loving father sends. 
Thus, acceptance never slams the door on hope. Yet even while it hopes, our relinquishment must be the real thing. And this giving up of self-will is the hardest thing we human beings are ever called to do. You know, I can identify with this in my own life when I've prayed for the land, the piece of land uh, that we believe in God for, for our church venue. You know, these things can become an idol when we're so demanding about it, when we're so set that this is the route we have to go. I had to come to a place a few, literally a few days ago where God led me to pray, a prayer of relinquishment, where I had to come to a place of saying, God, you know what? I realize that you can do great things with people who don't have a building. I cried out to God. I showed him my desire. I said to him, Lord, you know what we want to do. You know what we want to build. You know our heart to teach people on prayer, to make disciples. But I'm placing this in your hand. All I can say to you is watch this space. Watch this space because I know that something has broken through after that prayer of relinquishment. You know, sometimes you have to relinquish your idea of what a good life actually looks like. Sometimes that's relinquishment. Maybe you have to relinquish by accepting what you're good at and what you're not good at. And this sometimes means that you're relinquishing your need to be good at certain things that you've idolized in the past. I'll never be a great worship leader, for example, and that's okay. You know, my wife says that will be a distraction anyway, okay? When you do so, it's such a great place of freedom. When you don't, you're constantly wondering, oh, why didn't they choose me to sing that song? Oh, I was trying to land that song and they didn't let me land it. Oh, right? For some people, it's actually about coming to accept that God is your source, not your company, not your organization. And as you pray very demanding prayers about what needs to happen in your organization, and God may be thinking to himself, my will for you is for you to start your own business, but I'm not going to override your will. Barbara Lardinay says, relinquishment usually comes only after every other prayer type has been thoroughly tried and exhausted, desperation included. Often we come to a place of praying the prayer of relinquishment when we have prayed all sorts of other prayers. We've even been demanding to God and then he leads us to that pray place of actually just letting go. Just letting go. And so I trust that you've been ministered to as I've taken you through these prayers. The prayer of consecration, the prayer of confession, and the prayer of relinquishment. I want to encourage you to incorporate these prayers into your prayer time and ask God to really show you when to use them. I'm telling you, it will just take your prayer to another level. God wants to take us to another level of prayer. And I'll continue next week talking about some other uncommon prayers. Father, thank you for those who've listened to this message. Please speak to us. Please activate us to a new dimension of prayer as we go deeper, Lord, into these uncommon prayers. Give us wisdom, Lord God, concerning when we use these prayers and when we don't. Lead us, Lord, concerning the prayer of confession, the prayer of consecration, and also this prayer of relinquishment. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. I want to encourage you to join us for some of our prayer meetings. We've got prayer meetings taking place virtually every day. And you can look at our website and you can see the template there where you actually see the different days we are praying. God is doing something so powerful. And one of the ways you learn to pray is actually by praying with others who are more mature in prayer than you. God bless you. We love you.